It was a dark, tempestuous night on the 28th of September 1879 in eastern Scotland. A hurricane-force wind violently buffets at anything in its way, whipping up raindrops into stinging spikes that prickle the faces of anyone unlucky enough to be out in it. Such a violent storm had not been witnessed for decades. At 19.13 hours, a train driver slowed his locomotive to a crawl and reached out his arm. He grabbed the single-line token for the next section. Once this was secured, he eased open the regulator and his southbound train slowly took up the strain and sped on its way. The driver would have to slow again at the next signal box a little over two miles away to give up the single-line token, a journey length of around six to eight minutes maximum. The train had been booked to arrive at the city of Dundee at 19.30. The passengers would no doubt be looking forward to celebrating Hogmanay, the traditional Scots word for New Year, in three days' time. However, the train would never reach the next box. After 35 fraught minutes of waiting, the signalman sent two lads to venture down the line in search of the missing train. This walk took them onto the new bridge spanning the Firth of Tay, a marvel of Victorian engineering opened just a year and a half earlier. As they precariously walked along the deck of the bridge, the storm fought them every step of the way, their heavy serge greatcoats being soaked through and the wind threatening to sweep them off their feet. One man, James Smith, clung to the parapet railings, his eyes squinting into the blackness of the night. He daren't carry on. His mate, James Roberts, a locomotive foreman, battled on. As Roberts reached the next section of the bridge, a high lattice box girder central piece of the structure, he stopped. He could go no further, for instead of the deck of the bridge, he was staring down into a churning black abyss that was the River Tay. Where once had stood a fine structure was now a mess of twisted ironwork, destroyed and cast aside as if it were a flimsy child's toy. The horrified signalman ran back to his box as fast as he could, a fear growing in the pit of his stomach. When he reached the warm safety of the box, he rang the adjacent boxes either way by the bell code system, warning of a grave emergency. With that, all signals were set to danger, trains being forced to grind to a halt. As daylight dawned the following morning, everyone's worst fears were realised. The train was nowhere to be seen, and a huge section of bridge now lay partially breaking the surface of the water. This was the Victorian age, at the age of man's disdain for Mother Nature as he continued to overcome her, the age of hubris. Just what the hell had happened, and furthermore, where was the missing train and its human cargo? Today, descent into darkness stares into the boiling maelstrom in The Tay Bridge, Death by Design. The River Tay is the longest river in Scotland and seventh longest in Great Britain, and is the largest in terms of volume of discharge. Gross. Its name is thought to derive from the Gaelic word taha, meaning either silent or strong or flowing. It flows through the cities of Perth and Dundee in eastern Scotland as it snakes its way to the North Sea. It is known to have one of the strongest currents in the British Isles, a treacherous waterway that is notoriously difficult to cross by boat. Coupled to this is the extreme weather conditions posed by the valley that, that the Tay carved out for itself over millions of years, forming a gigantic natural wind tunnel that amplifies and channels strong winds along its length. It was over this wide and shimmering gap that the North British Railway Company sought to cross with a new bridge linking Dundee to lines heading south without having to skirt around the river or cross at a much narrower point, which would create far too much of a delay in detour. This link would also provide a continuous line from Edinburgh through to Aberdeen. A bridge at this point would be no easy task, the weather conditions notwithstanding, at a shade over two miles long, the Tay Bridge would be the longest ever built to that point. Coupled with this was the need to have a deck high enough and the spans wide enough to allow shipping to pass underneath, many vessels of the age still being sail-powered with tall masts. The project would require one of the finest engineering minds of the day, a true genius. The North British Railway approached the renowned civil engineer 
Thomas Bouch, and gave him the brief for the project. Bouch threw himself into the task with an enthusiastic passion, along with big promises, which was good because the NBR wanted the new bridge as soon as humanly possible, and of course as cheaply as practicable. The ironwork was supplied by the Middlesbrough-based Hopkin Jilkson Company, although they were reluctantly forced to produce most of the cast components at Wormit in Scotland, which just so happened to be on the south side of the River Tay, at the point where the bridge was to cross. This, of course, was done for convenience, but the company really would have preferred to use its own experienced staff and machinery back in Middlesbrough. The deck sections were to sit on dual iron columns sat upon brick-built piers, that were built using the caisson method. A caisson is essentially a gigantic iron tube that is upended and allowed to sink down to the riverbed. After this, the water is pumped out and the workers lowered in to dig out the mud and clay until they reach the solid bedrock underneath. Once this was reached, bricks or blocks are laid and cemented in place and built up to the required height, and the centre of the pier was filled with concrete and allowed to cure whereupon the caisson tube was removed. At the point of the deepest channel of the river, the deck design was altered to give the maximum clearance to shipping passing beneath. This involved changing from an underslung lattice truss to a lattice box that enveloped the deck over the top. Astonishingly, the distance between the piers at this section was 245 feet, an unprecedented gap in similar bridges of this general design a huge increase even compared to other Bouch designs. In total, the bridge would measure 10,709 feet in length and rise 83 feet above the water at its highest section. Interestingly, the bridge incorporated a curve and a gradient, a double rarity. The construction project was not without its problems. Two of the box section lattices broke free of their fetters whilst being lifted into place during a high wind and were sent tumbling into the Tay. A foreshadow of things to come, perhaps. Astoundingly, one of these fallen sections was recovered, straightened out and re-erected to its original intended position, no doubt as a cost and time-saving measure. The Board of Trade's Railway Department conducted an inspection of the finished project in February of 1878, and apart from a small number of snagging issues requiring remedial work, the overall conclusion was highly satisfactory. A recommendation was made that trains were to be restricted to 25 miles per hour. Some flexing and oscillation were observed when a test train was driven over the bridge, but the amount was considered to be within a reasonable tolerance. One criticism of the design was that it only carried a single line, necessitating only one train to be crossing at a time for either direction, creating a natural choke point in the route, but this was more of an inconvenience than anything else. Queen Victoria travelled across the bridge in her lavishly appointed royal carriage on her return from Balmoral near Aberdeen, around three weeks after the bridge was officially opened to traffic in June 1878, and was much impressed by it, to the point where, upon her arrival back at Windsor Castle, Thomas Bouch was presented to her, and she knighted him for his work. In an interesting aside, Queen Victoria was rather afraid of train travel, even insisting that the train come to a complete halt if she wished to get up and switch seats. The now Sir Thomas Bouch was no doubt flying high at the ultimate reward for a lifelong career being capped by this, his magnum opus. However, 18 months later, catastrophe was laying in wait. The down mail train to Burns Island, hauled by NBR 440 steam locomotive number 224, built by Thomas Wheatley of Cowlairs near Glasgow, and was hauling six vehicles. The train had around 60 people on board, including the driver, fireman and guard, or engineer, stoker and conductor for you much-valued viewers in the USA. The train had already crossed the bridge earlier that day without issue, but now the return journey would prove fatal to all on board. As driver David Mitchell caught the outheld single-line token from the signalman at the bridge's south box, neither he, his fireman John Marshall, or the signalman at either end, couldn't see far enough ahead of them into the driving rain. 
When the train had moved around 200 yards onto the bridge into the gloom of the storm and out of sight from either side, a mate of the signalman who was looking out the window toward the bridge claimed that he could see a shower of sparks in the distance. This could have been caused by several reasons, possibly the collapsing of the structure, or the train being blown by the force of the wind, pushing the steel wheel flanges against the rail. Whatever the cause, it was the last glimpse of the train that would ever be witnessed. The entirety of the train and every member of its human cargo had zero chance of survival from their 83 feet plunge into the icy water. The coaching stock being primarily wooden bodied would have simply disintegrated instantly. Immediately when the light and weather had calmed enough, rescue craft were launched into the river to hopefully recover any survivors. Unfortunately this search would prove fruitless. Very quickly, the efforts shifted their focus to that of recovery. Divers were sent down to examine the wreckage. Bodies began to be pulled from the black water. Not that many were recovered in this manner, with a number being washed ashore in the months following the incident. This led to some ongoing confusion as to the exact number of victims, although the consensus these days puts the final figure at 60, hence my earlier quoting of this number, although estimates have put the figure as high as 75. The first body to be pulled from the water had washed up on the south bank a short distance downstream near Tayport. It was that of Anne Cruikshanks, her possessions being only one item, a train ticket to Brochty Ferry. Another body was spotted in the river by local lad Andrew Johnston. When it was pulled from the water and discreetly displayed for identification purposes, Andrew Johnston took one look at the corpse and stopped cold. He instantly recognised it as that of his brother David, a guard on the train, his pocket watch frozen in time at 16 minutes past seven. Forty-six bodies would be found in total. The others would remain eternal prisoners of the Tay. A relief fund was set up by, for the families of the victims, which raised a total of £1,900 and 16 shillings, just shy of £126 million in today's money. This included donations of £500 from the North British Railway and 250 from Sir Thomas Bouch himself. The Board of Trade immediately sprang into action and set up an inquiry into what had happened. Once the fallen sections of the structure had been raised, it became quickly apparent to all that the fault lay squarely at the design of the bridge itself, it simply was not fit for purpose. The ironwork was judged to be flimsy. A section of one of the iron columns currently on display at, in Dundee is a great example. It looks far too thin and dainty to hold up something so hefty. And this appears to have been the case throughout many sections, as many were found to have imperfections in their metallurgic composition that had been masked with a mixture of iron filings and wax used as filler, smoothed over and then painted with black lead. Enginemen had reported that as their locos had passed from the low to the high girder sections, there was a pronounced dip in the track work, which they described as the engine nodding. Could this have possibly been the section that was reused following the accident during construction? The inquiry also heard evidence from witnesses who claimed that despite the speed limit of 25 miles per hour, some trains were going over at speed in excess of 45 miles per hour. This does not sound like much of a damning detail, but when one considers the hammer-blow effect of piston-driven locomotives on the permanent way, it could be easily argued that this could have been a contributing factor to the bridge's eventual failure by hastening its demise. It was also found that the original design had been altered, which would have seen the deck entirely supported by higher stone pillars, but was later changed to iron columns to save time. Even more worryingly was the fact that the high girders were not even solidly fixed to the columns, instead seated upon bearing surfaces, allowing for more flex and heat expansion. It is not clear whether this design was done by Bouch himself or by one of the on-site project overseers. When the train was found by divers, the entirety of it was still encased within the high girder section that it had fallen in with, between piers 32 and 33 these marking the fourth and fifth piers of the high girder section. The locomotive's regulator handle, although bent, was found to still be in the fully open position. This shows that the collapse must have been sudden, 
the whole thing basically coming down all at once. The engineman never saw it coming. The three-man inquiry board concluded several factors to be at fault. One of them outright lay the blame squarely at Sir Thomas Bouch, but the other two believed it was a combination of the alterations to the original design, the failure to account for extreme weather, contractors cutting corners in the quality of the materials, and the NBR for failing to enforce the speed limit on the bridge. It should come as no surprise to say that the weather was the major contributing factor in the collapse, the wind and rain being whipped up to speeds of between 55 to 72 miles per hour. This powerful storm exerted extra load onto the bridge. Furthermore, it is not an unknown phenomenon for early, lightly built trains to be literally blown off the tracks by strong winds, although this seems to have been more of a problem in the USA, particularly the dust belt in the so-called Tornado Alley. A modern theory that has been advanced by local Dundee man named Bill Dow, who, after years of poring over all the available primary and secondary evidence, formed the notion that one of the vehicles had become derailed at the point where the rails were known to have a defect in them, as noted above. The carriage would then have continued rolling along the deck of the bridge, still attached to the train, until it hit one of the cast-iron lugs on either side of the high girder section. It may have been this smash that sent the shock wave through the column and triggered a spontaneous collapse. This would also tie in with the witness in the signal box claiming to see the shower of sparks. Ultimately, though, it will remain an ever-elusive answer. As incredulous and macabre as it may seem, in a bid to save money, the recovered locomotive was put back into service. Amazingly, it was intact enough to be dragged back to Cowlairs on its own wheels for the repairs, although the superstitious train crews were somewhat understandably reluctant to drive the perceived Jinx engine, naming her the Diver. The first man brave enough to take to the controls was driver Robert Marshall, the brother of fireman John Marshall, who had perished in the plunge. The locomotive was finally withdrawn in 1919 and scrapped. Upon publication of the inquiry's report, swift action was taken to help prevent anything similar happening again. Surveys were carried out on all of Thomas Bouch's pre-existing works, and some other bridges were found to be lacking in sufficient strength to withstand extreme weather. Despite this, he was still not considered to be an overall bad engineer. His high lattice viaduct at Beeler, along the Eden Valley line near Kirkby Stephen, this beautiful structure was built before the Tay Bridge in 1860 and stood strong until its destruction following the line closure in 1963, 103 years with zero problems. However, because of the Tay Bridge disaster, Sir Thomas Boucher's professional reputation was irrevocably shattered. He died less than two years after the disaster in October of 1880. He was only 58. The Journal of the Institute of Civil Engineers wrote of him thusly, Quote, in his death, the profession has to lament one who, though perhaps carrying his works nearer to the margin of safety than many others would have done, displayed boldness, originality and resource in a high degree, and bore a distinguished part in the later development of the railway system. End quote. Four years after the disaster, a new grand bridge began construction north of Edinburgh across the Firth of Forth, the designers John Fowler and Benjamin Baker were determined to make this bridge as safe as humanly possible. The design utilised a cantilever design that equals out the opposing forces of the weight of the structure, as demonstrated in a contemporary photograph. Strangely enough, the original plan for the fourth rail bridge was to be a suspension bridge, designed by Sir Thomas Bouch. But with his reputation in tatters, that was never to be. Barely six months after the disaster, the NBR submitted plans for a new bridge for Parliament's approval. So as not to have too major a diversion, the simple solution was to build the new bridge right next to the old one. So that's exactly what they did. In fact, the new bridge would only be 60 feet upstream of the old one. Once all of the wreckage had been cleared away and the old bridge dismantled, work began on the new structure. 
the new design would not be unlike the old one in general principle, i.e. a deck sat atop trussed sections on regular upright pillars. However, this one would be double track to increase the number of train paths available, and had the covered section made of whaleback girders, rather than the square lattice of before. This provides much more flexing strength from all vertices. Instead of the uprights standing on one pillar, the load was spread across two pillars, being tied at the top of the masonry, with a stout ironwork meeting at the top, just underneath the deck to form an arch. In all, the new bridge would use around 37,500 tonnes of metalwork and bricks, and around 70,000 tonnes of concrete. The new bridge was completed in 1887, on the date of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, and has been going strong ever since. If you think that modern music and its lyrics are bad, such as being asked if you ever feel like a plastic bag, or being encouraged to go to Times Square and take a picture with a particular brand of camera, then boy have I got a doozy for you. Enter Scottish quote-unquote poet William Topaz McGonagall, widely regarded as the worst poet in history, and his three, yes, three, different tributes to the Tay Bridge are a prime example of this terrible writer. I sincerely apologise in advance, dear viewer, for the truckload of cringe I'm about to subject you to. I have deliberately not pre-read these poems beforehand, as I want us to figuratively hold hands whilst I cold-read my way through this in my best Scottish accent, and my family is mostly Scottish, so I can get away with it. Upon the opening of the Tay Bridge on, the, on June the 1st, 1878, McGonagall published his ode to the new structure thusly. Quote, Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, with your numerous arches and pillars in so grand array, and your central girders which seem to my eye to be almost towering to the sky. The greatest wonder of the day, and a great beautification to the River Tay, most beautiful to be seen, near by Dundee and the Magdalen Green. Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay that has caused the Emperor of Brazil to leave his home far away, incognito in his dress, and view thee ere he pass along en route to Inverness. Good God. Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, the longest of the present day, that has ever crossed o'er a tidal river stream, most gigantic to be seen, nearby Dundee and the Magdalen Green. Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, which will cause great rejoicing on the opening day, and hundreds of people will come from far away, also the Queen, most gorgeous to be seen, nearby Dundee and the Magdalen Green. Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, and prosperity to Provost Cox, who has given £30,000 and upward away in helping to erect the bridge of the Tay, most handsome to be seen, nearby Dundee and the Magdalen Green. Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, I hope that God will protect all passengers by night and by day, and that no accident will befall them by, while crossing the bridge of the Silvery Tay, for that would be most awful to be seen, nearby Dundee and the Magdalen Green. Jesus, Bill, you're a bit of a jinx. Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, and prosperity to Messrs. Bouch and Groth, the famous engineers of the present day, who have succeeded in erecting the railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, which stands unequalled to be seen nearby Dundee and the Magdalen Green. Unquote. Wow. Following the disaster, and clearly wishing to make things even worse, McGonagall penned the Taybridge Disaster Poem. <laughs> oh dear. Quote, Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, Alas, I am very sorry to say, That ninety lives have been taken away On the last Sabbath day of 1879, Which will be remembered for a very long time. 
God. "'Twas about seven o'clock at night, and the wind it blew with all its might, and the rain came pouring down, and the dark clouds seemed to frown, and the demon of the air seemed to say, I'll blow down the bridge of Tay. When the train left Edinburgh, the passengers' hearts were light and felt no sorrow, but Boreas blew a terrific gale, which made their hearts for to quail. <laughs> Christ! And many of the passengers with fear did say, I hope God will send us safe across the bridge of t bridge of Tay. But when the train came near to Wormit Bay, Boreas he did loud and angry bray, and shook the central girders of the bridge of Tay on the last Sabbath day of eighteen seventy nine, which will be remembered for a very long time. So the train sped on with all its might, and Bonnie Dundee soon hove in sight. And the passengers' hearts felt light, thinking that they would enjoy themselves on the new year, with their friends at home they loved most dear, and wished them all a happy new year. Oh my God! Oh dear! So the train moved slowly along the bridge of Tay until it was about midway. <laughs> then the central girders with a crash gave way, and down went the train and passengers into the Tay. The storm fiend did loudly bray, because ninety lives had been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. As soon as the catastrophe came to be known, the alarm from mouth to mouth was blown, and the, a and the cry rang out all over the town, Good heavens, the Tay Bridge is blown down! <laughs> oh, stop it! And the passenger train from Edinburgh, which filled all the people's hearts with sorrow, had and made them for to turn pale, because none of the passengers were saved to tell the tale. How the disaster happened on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. God, the flow of this thing is terrible. It must have been an awful sight to witness in the dusky moonlight, while the storm fiend did laugh and angry did bray along the railway bridge of the Silvery Tay. O oh, ill-fated bridge of the Silvery Tay, I must now conclude, my lay, thank God, by telling the world fearlessly, without the least dismay, that your central girders would not have given way, at least many sensible men do say, had they been supported on each side with buttresses, at least many sensible men confesses. <laughs> For the stronger we our houses do build, the less chance we have of being killed. <laughs> Christ! What the hell is that? Who writes that? Oh my God, that's awful. Oh, Jesus. Mm. And of course, not wanting to miss another chance to punish the world, McGonagall published his third poem upon the completion of the new Tay Bridge. Quote, Beautiful new railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, with your strong brick piers and buttresses in so grand array, and your thirteen central girders which seem to my eye, because you're the expert, strong enough all windy storms to defy. And as I gaze upon thee, my heart feels gay, because thou art the greatest railway bridge of the present day, and can be seen for miles away, from north, south, east, or west of the Tay. <laughs> On a beautiful, clear and sunshiny day, <laughs> and ought to make the hearts of the Mars boys feel gay. Mm, I see. Because thine equal nowhere can be seen, only nearby Dundee and the bonny Magdalen Green. Beautiful a new railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, with thy beautiful side-screens along your railway, 
which will be the greatest protection on a windy day, so as the railway carriages won't be blown away. <laughs> oh, God. And ought to cheer the hearts of the passengers night and day, as they were conveyed along thy beautiful railway, and towering above the silvery tay. Spanning the beautiful river shore to shore, upward of two miles and more, which is most beautiful to be seen, near by Dundee and the bonny Magdalen Green. Thy structure to my eye seems strong and grand, and the workmanship most skilfully planned, and I hope the engineers, Messrs. Barlow and Arrol, will prosper for many a day. For erecting thee across the beautiful Tay, and I think nobody needs to have the least dismay to cross o'er thee by night or by day. God, is there is constant recycling of lines. Because thy strength is visible to be seen, near by Dundee and the bonny Magdalen Green. Beautiful new railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, I wish you success for many a year and a day, and I hope thousands of people will come from far away, both high and low, without delay, from north, south, east and west, because as a railway bridge, <laughs> thou art the best. <laughs> For fuck's sake. Thou standest unequalled to be seen, near by Dundee and Bonnie Magdalen Green. And for beauty thou art most lovely to be seen, as the train crosses o'er thee, with her cloud full of steam, and you look well painted the colour of Maron. Maron? And to find thy equal there is none. Oh, fuck off! Oh, come on! Maron? Just... Ugh. Moron, more like. Jesus. Oh, wow. Which, without fear of contradiction, I, vent I venture to say, because you are the longest railway bridge of the present day, that now crosses o'er a tidal river stream, and the most handsome to be seen, near by Dundee and the bonny Magdalen Green. The New Yorkers boast of the Brooklyn Bridge, but in comparison to me... It seems like a midge. <laughs> oh, what? What are you doing to me, man? <sighs> because thou spannest the silvery tay a mile or more longer, I venture to say. Besides, the railway carriages are pulled across by rope. Therefore, Brooklyn Bridge cannot with thee cope. <laughs> what? Ah! God, this is painful. And as you have been opened on the 20th day of June, I hope Her Majesty Queen Victoria will visit thee very soon, because thou art worthy of a visit from Duke, Lord or Queen, and strong and securely built, which is most worthy to be seen, nearby Dundee and the Bonnie Magdalen Green. Come on, Bill, mate, the people have suffered enough. Oh, my Christ. Please, dear viewers, if my writing ever becomes this lazy and awful for the love of God and all things holy, please, please tell me. Oh, it's over. Thank God it's over. Okay, back to the serious stuff. The Tay Bridge disaster represents one of the worst tragedies in the days of the early railways. It also became a cautionary tale against arrogance, and a lesson in how one should never underestimate the power of Mother Nature, for she is far mightier and more ferocious than anything man could ever hope to achieve. Sixty-two years after the Tay Bridge collapse, lessons clearly had not been learned when the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State, a subject which will no doubt get a video of its own in the future. Today, if you are fortunate enough to travel over the new Tay Bridge, you can still see the old brick pillars of the ill-fated bridge still standing defiantly poking their heads above the Tay's surface, a constant reminder of the disaster and a lesson to never cut corners. 
When the bean counters and impatient businessmen get too involved in engineering and construction projects, it very rarely ends in success. But will they ever learn? I sincerely doubt it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and found it informative and entertaining. Did I miss something? If so, please feel free to share with me in the comments as I'm always looking to learn something new. Or if you have any suggestions for further videos, I shall happily add them to the to-do list. I shall leave you with the names of the known victims of this tragedy. Please like and subscribe for more content, and I will see you on our next Descent into Darkness.